Get your Action Force Desert Rat figure because it's time for action. Pre-orders coming soon exclusively to Valiverse.com. Hello and welcome to the Analog Toys live stream. And it's a slightly unusual one today. I've got a very special guest uh, and it feels weird calling him a guest because he's going to come onto the channel and interview Desert Rat. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce onto the channel for the very first time, my new friend, Grindhead Jim. Um, excuse me. <laughs> Jim, how are you, mate? Pretty good. Pretty good. How are you doing? I'm, I'm good, man. I've been looking forward to this. Ever, ever since I saw you on, on Jody's live stream, you know, where they were doing like the Iconicon wrap up, uh, there was a few kind of standout stars of that show, obviously a world made of cardboard, but I, um, uh, I was just in, intrigued by, uh, your passion and your presence and you, you spoke so articulately and you're, you're funny as hell, man. Um, so, uh, I'm glad you found the channel and you found this community and, um, and, uh, you're, you're ex-military yourself. Yeah, I was in the Marines for five years, did uh, signals intelligence, and I the, at the latter half, which we can talk about in more detail as it relates to what you were doing, uh, I was helping prep uh, Marine recon units for doing what we were doing remotely in, in country. Uh, yeah. So we've chewed a lot of the same dirt from different perspectives, which is part of why I feel a kinship to you. So you know, yeah. I really appreciate the great intro and so forth. I can assure you, I'm not that special. I'm just a fat guy into grind <laughs> corn, coffee, and beer. Um, we just share some interests, man. Um, so this is a great honor for me, and you know I, I love speaking to other veterans and so forth. So this is going to be just a great treat overall. So now that we've uh, given ourselves a nice back massage, let's kind of get to the subject at hand here. So uh, I want to preface this for chat by saying that you guys know the basic story. I am not going to sit here for an hour and retread the same things that we've been doing uh, as a community for the last couple of weeks since we found out the wonderful news that Tony's going to become an action figure. We all know that. We're all here for that. But I want to dig more into not so much the why the decision was made, but why it's such a great decision that was made, why it makes sense get the backstory so that when you're holding this figure in your hand for the first time, you can have a sense of history, a sense of, uh, of wonderment and understand what makes desert rat. So very, very special. And you have a really varied, but also at the same time, kind of focused career in the military. Um, so I know that there's things that we can talk about in concept. Obviously, there's certain particulars that we're not going to be able to talk about because of classification and so forth like that. So we're going to try and navigate the waters as best we can. So what I want to first talk about is there was a transition from when you were in the British Royal Military uh, and you'd left and then came back and you were able to transition into the SAS. Uh, that that line is something that's pretty well tread. So I don't think we have to go into too much detail, but tell me more about the circumstances of that decision. Cause I know that you had gone, I, you know, I could do that. But when it happened, when you really went in, I want you to go into detail on what you, how you, well you were prepared going in, what was different? What were your greatest challenges? Give me the nitty gritty on, on what it felt like to just be just basically to go into the deep end into the SAS, like how that just went there for you. Yeah, so um, just a real quick super chat from Jody. He says it's showtime. Thank you very much, Jody. Um, so, sorry, popping up wrong comments here. I'll let, I'll let Michael, I'll let you do it in the background. <laughs> it's easier. Well, we're, I'm putting up a comment and he's pulling it down. So, um, there was, a, there was a big event that, that changed my life in my in my early 20s. Um, in between leaving the Australian Army, I, I went travelling. And um, in July of 2001, um, I had been working for several months in, in a bar in Spain, um, staying in like a backpacker's hostel, and I had a good friend um, who I'd be, you know, become friends with while I was staying there. Um, Basically, a drunken brawl erupted one night um, out on the balcony of this this hostel, and um, another guy who was staying there completely snapped and 
uh, stabbed my friend 17 times and in the time it took me to, to run about three metres and, and wrestle him to the ground. Um, and I managed to keep my friend alive for around 45 minutes. He eventually uh, bled out and, and died on that balcony at about one o'clock in the morning. And it completely changed who I was. I've, I've, I've said many times that there are two Tony Robertses who've lived in this world. The person I was before that night and the person I was after that night. Um, I became very emotionally detached in a way. Um, from that night on, I didn't really have another relationship until I actually met Grace, which was 10 years later. So, um, so fast forward a little bit. After that had happened, I returned to the UK, my country of birth, um, and not long later, um, the events of September 11 happened, and I was like, "Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna re-enlist." And I had a good job at the time, so I enlisted in the Territorial Army, which is the Army Reserve. Mm -hmm. um, but how I ended up on selection was quite by accident. I went to a combat infantry course as, as part of my kind of um, training for my new infantry role in the Territorial Army. I hadn't been with them only a few months, and during that course, a recruiting team come to every one of those courses at Catterick um, to try and encourage people to go on special forces selection. And at the time, I was quite well versed in what the SAS was and, you know, I'd read a lot of books, but I had no concept that they had a reserve unit. Um, actually, they have two. Uh, they have two reserve. So one is the south of England and Wales and the other one is the north of England and Scotland. So okay, yeah. um, I left them my contact details, um, my, my, my mailing address, that kind of thing, and in my head, I was like, I am about the right age. I am physically fit. Um, I want to have a crack at this. I might do this next year. Now, they do two selection courses a year. You either do summer selection or winter selection, and there are pros and cons to both. Um, but I was really walked away from that after giving them my details. And I'm going to do this next year. Well, a week later, I get an envelope in the mail saying, come up this weekend for um, a medical assessment and a, and a fitness test and, and stuff. So I went to Regent's Park Barracks in London. Um, and before I knew it, a few months later, like I, I just went along with it and I was on selection and I really was not as well prepared as I, as I should have been. I was not fit enough. Um, a really key part of passing, certainly the first stage of selection that they call aptitude. Um, you basically spend four weeks marching around the Brecon Beacon Mountains in Wales each day, longer distances, heavier weight on your back, but you do it all on your own. Um, you don't march in, in teams. It's all about the individual, whether they can push themselves. You have to get, you have to cover distance at a certain speed, but also you have to be able to navigate through mountainous terrain, which can get, um, you know, when they, they, they call it the clag, when the clag comes in, it's like the, the clouds are, you know, you're at the top of these mountains and you're walking through clouds and you can only see 20 meters ahead of you. And you right. might have a five kilometer leg and you're, and all you're trying to find is a small little green tent in, you know, in the middle of the mountains, you've got to try and get yourself there. And then when you arrive there, they tell you where the next one is. And um, my navigation could have been, I, I became a, a very good navigator uh, after time to the point where I would just, um, navigate via what we call map to ground. I wouldn't even use a compass um, just by following the contour lines of, of, of mountains. And um, right. you discover that it's far easier to climb to the top of a ridge and and run 10 kilometres around like the high point of a ridge to get to where you need to go rather than go down the valley and back up in a, in a straight line, which is, uh, you know, pe people inexperienced at navigating would just take a compass bearing and walk in a straight line and, Right, which is what a, a lot of basic training tends to teach you, and yeah. it's 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 a, I would say even in today's military, to a certain degree, that that true map reading is really becoming a lost art. People are becoming too uh, reliant on like sat devices and GPS and so forth. And uh, at the end of the day, you have to be able to get a lay of the land and have an idea of where you are in terms of altitude and everything, and be able to adjust for that. Um, so it's interesting that even 20 years ago, uh, that that was something that you were able to pretty much, it sounds like you were able to teach yourself. Um, I, I had to, I kind of, I kind of, I kind of learned on, on the course. Um, 
I'd made a few mistakes in in so it, 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 there's there's four weeks you spend in Wales. In the first week, you can't fail. Um, um, so if 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 you well if you get completely lost, you know, and they have to send out a search party, then you, then you're off the course. But sure. um, if you make it to various checkpoints, but you've gone over time, they let you get away with that in the first week. Then into the second week, it starts to get a a bit harder. The distances get longer, and then they're all leading up to. To test week and and I had you know speaking to other guys on the course because each night we would go back to to Sandy Bridge Barracks and you know I had some friends on the course and there was other guys I was becoming friends with during the course. Um, but to start off, we started off with I think it was like 197 people on selection, um, and at the end of the first month we were down to 55 I think so pretty much three quarters, and the vast majority of those guys did not fail the course; they failed themselves. So at any moment during this course, you can what they call VW, which is voluntarily withdraw. And it doesn't matter where you are. It, it can be at the barracks before you even start the march in the morning. A lot of guys just kind of stick their hand up and go, no, I'm not doing it today. I'm, I'm done. I'm out. Um, and once you do that, you don't get a second attempt on selection. Makes sense. I mean, it's one of these things where that kind of position, that kind of job, uh, and the various special forces across the world, you don't get a second chance at the job. So for selection, it makes perfect sense to me because it's one of these things that I don't think a lot of civilians really understand uh, the kinds of pressure, even on a training level, that you have to go through because, like you said, you have to rely on yourself. And the way that it has always, in, in those types of situations, for me, it has kind of gotten to a point where yes you to a certain degree you're training yourself and you're competing against yourself for the goal of earning the privilege of being on a team that's yep. kind of so i like the fact that um during selection that it's very similar to what i'm familiar with which is it's all on you and then once you've proven yourself then you get to kind of interlock with others that have done the same thing and I would imagine that the camaraderie is tenfold. Um, at least I found that with my comrades in recon. Uh, would, well, how would you contrast the basic infantry experience to a graduation into the SAS? How, how, what was the contrast in terms of how it felt? <clears throat> this might be a little bit controversial. <laughs> Because I of the come here to ask you easy questions, Tony. I did not come here to ask you easy questions. Good, good. Um, because of the nature of the course and the type of person that they are, you know, that there is no sort of to be a special forces soldier, it's not a case of he needs that attribute, that attribute, that attribute. The guys in that unit of them. All different walks of life. They're all different shapes, sizes, ages, different interests. Um, one key thing is that they are all quite intelligent. Um, but the big difference I, I found, having gone through, example, the combat infantryman course that I did at Catterick where I first heard about this, mm -hmm. um, went through that with a, with a team of guys and we came back and we had really bonded when we got back to battalion. You know, we had just done that, that intense course together um, and there was really that bond. The Special Forces, it's kind of quite different because you get to the end of selection and you've gone quite often, like I had several of my close friends did not pass the course. So I kind of got to the end and my, my, my friends had left. And then you, 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 you graduate into this regiment and it's almost like um, you have to prove yourself all over again. Now you're, you're back at square one. And that actually, and this is going to be the controversial part, the regiment is so full of alpha males that um, some of the good aspects of being in the regiment is that, like, everybody wants to be there. You know, I've been in other parts of the army, certainly general enlistment areas of the army, where some guys regret their choice of joining, and you know, there, there, there can be there can be a, a bit of a bit of dissension towards you know the establishment itself uh, in the regiment. Sure. You're working 100% with guys who not only really want to be there, but have have gone through hell to get there. Um, but also, they can be such alpha males that I actually found um, it difficult to to make really close bonds with a lot of people. I only had a, like a handful of close friends, as opposed to 
other parts of the army I'd been in where like the whole platoon were, you know, were, were, were brothers. This was very different. And you move around a lot as well. You're always, depending on your skill set, you're working with different people all the time. So, um, yeah, it was interesting. I can imagine too, because I would assume too that part of the purpose of the training is to really bolster your self-reliance as well. And yep. as that becomes something that goes from theory into practice, it doesn't surprise me that between the uh, psychological bravado that one has to have to be in that position, as well as that at that by that point, very ingrained, inbred self-reliance, of course, you're going to have a lot of individuality dictating things. What has always fascinated me, though, is that when it comes to the mission, you know, when the the switch gets turned on, people just do their jobs and do what they have to do. So you went into this, this regimen, you went through the kind of the, for lack of a better term, the initiation process, because Marines are very much the same way where each duty station you go to, you've got to kind of find your way. Um, it yep. doesn't matter what reputation precedes you or does not. Your resume does not matter. You're the new guy on the block and you have to kind of prove that you deserve to be there no matter what has come before. Um, was there anything, was there ever a time, was there ever a regret and uh, in, in, in going selection? Was there ever a point where it's like, this is not what I'm here for? Um, and granted, I realize that might be mission related and certainly if you skip over what you have to. Um, no, I, no, I don't, I don't have any regret. I really, I really wanted to, for, for me, not only selection, but my, my, Career. So, so the selection course is actually very, very long. Like I, I talk about the four weeks in Wales. That's that's just where you sort out the uh, what do they call it? You know, the wheat from the chaff kind of thing. Uh, you then you go on continuation training. You go to the you go to the jungle. You do resistance to interrogation training, where you know you you are in um, uh, an environment. You go through thirty six hours of um, stress positions and interrogations. You're blindfolded. You're treated like a prisoner of war. To uh, the only other people outside the special forces that do that course um, are fighter pilots. It's designed for people who go work behind enemy lines. Um, that was very, very, that was the, the one point that almost broke me. But the end of that course was the day that I, I, I got my beret. But I see my whole experience on selection and my time in the regiment really as an exploration of myself. I really wanted to, again, go, going back, to what happened in Spain. Um, mm -hmm. I'd had a very sheltered childhood. Like I came from a really good family. Um, we certainly weren't well off, but we never, you know, as children, we never want, needed for anything. My dad was a very hard worker. Um, they took, you know, moved his family to Australia when I was 11. Um, so when I left home at 17 and went into the Australian army, like I had no life experience at all. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think I'd ever, I had never been in a fight in high school. And um, I really think my parents doubted my ability to be a soldier. And, uh, and in a sense, they, they were right. Like I, I mentioned on the, on the G.I. Joe Burger podcast that right. my time in the Australian Army, I was not a very good soldier. I was too, too immature, too inexperienced. Um, basically, I did my four years and, and that I, I, at the time, I kind of regretted. Looking back now, I don't. But I got out going, you know, all my life I'd wanted to be a career soldier. I've done four years. I've ended up in a bad job because I, I didn't perform very well. And, but that night in Spain, when you see a crazy, intoxicated, violent man savagely attack your friend and everyone else runs away, and I was – I was, there was broken glass all over the it's – it's a bit of a long story – a guy got hit around the head with a with a, a vodka bottle that had smashed, and um, that kind of what triggered it all. But I was in a pair of shorts and nothing else. I ran, I sprinted barefoot through broken glass, and wrestled a, a knife wielding maniac to the ground, basically. Um, and we were sort of tussling on, on the ground, and I never knew I had that in me before that day. Um, 
to go on with the story a little bit more, that, that that Backpackers Hostel was a fair way outside of the main town. And, you know, this is 2001. Backpackers didn't own mobile phones. I wasn't even sure right. where the nearest pay phone was. It was 1 a.m. I just wanted to get help to my friend. And we were on this, this balcony of this hostel, and I heard a car coming down the street. I jumped off the balcony, like jumping out of a first-story window barefoot with glass stuck in my feet and, and fell into the road to stop this this car and this poor young Spanish woman, like I was covered in blood, freaked her out. Obviously, she called someone. So I, after that, I was like, no, I, I do have this in me if I am pushed to the limit. So that's the kind of approach I always – I would often – when I would be walking around the mountains or when I'd be – um, in like simulated torture positions in resistance to interrogation training, I would think back to that night and like, no, you know, you you, you found that in you before. It's it, it's there. It's it's you know that because that was all in, instinctive. It was everyone else ran away, and I was the one man who charged forward. And I suppose that was the first time I ever figured out whether I have fight or, fight or flight. Um, and I think for the first twenty odd years of my life, I always thought I was a flight type of person um, and it turns out I'm not so I, I don't I don't I don't have regrets um, th th there was a, there was a time when I regretted leaving the regiment to go and do private security work you know I was like you could have been a career soldier but I look back now and I was like no I, I made the right choice you know I, I went and experienced something completely different doing private security um, but that set me up financially to then, because I mean, I, I never thought I would settle down and be a family man. And, you know, after 10 years, it, basically it's 10 years between my time in the special forces and my time doing private security was roughly about nine and a half years. And then when I finally left, you know, I've returned to Australia after being away for a very long time. I, I, my, my whole family will tell you, like, I, they hadn't seen me in years. I wouldn't even come home and visit them for I think I went almost four years without seeing any of them at one point. And I returned home and they're like, I, I, the person you left, he's, he's gone. You're, you're a different guy, not in a bad way, um, but right. you're not the same person. And that is exactly true. Like once you see certain things, you can't unsee them and they can't stop affecting you, whether for good or for bad. So let's rewind a little bit to that transition from special forces into private security. Um, what led to that decision and how was that facilitated? Tell me about that process uh, and what it meant to you. Cause I know that we can talk about that a little bit more. Uh, so yeah. I'm very interested in that. Um, basically I was, I was at a, a, a bit of a, a bit of a crossroad. I, I had a decision to make, um, you know, we, 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 we signed different contracts and, um, I was getting ready to, to sign another two-year contract to do um, a, a cycle, which that two-year cycle would be split into six months. You would have a training cycle, a tour. Um, right. Um, you would spend some time, basically, you'd spend a six-month period like on call being able to respond to stuff within the United Kingdom. And, um, and I, and I, I walked into... I walked into a pub one day to have a few beers with, with, with some mates and um, I was pretty sure I was going to sign on for another two years at that point, but I had like another week to before I had to make my decision. And, uh, and I walked into the pub and I, I bumped into an old sergeant of mine who'd got out of the army two years before. Mm -hmm. And he was like, Hey man, what, what's going on? What are you up to? And I was like, Oh, you know, I'm at, uh, you know, um, about to, about to renew my contract. And he's like, why don't you come and work for me in Baghdad? We've got a job bodyguard in for a cnn news crew i could use a good guy like you um and he's like and the, the timing is like it's perfect it's like i need someone out there in in about a month and if you don't sign on next week you're you're free to go um and i was like oh i'm not sure and he was like we'll pay you one hundred and seventy thousand dollars a year tax free i went okay done i mean <laughs> exactly at, at, at the time i was i was earning about uh probably about eighty thousand dollars that's in american dollars um, right. right i was earning around eighty thousand it was like more than double what i was already earning plus i was paying tax on my eighty thousand so um right. so that's literally it was a decision made in a like like most great decisions i've made in my life it was in a pub over a beer <laughs> <laughs> um without going into detail i can certainly relate to that my friend um yeah. 
And, uh, and Tree Theodore, thank you for the super chat. He says, uh, we salute you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Tree. Right back at you. Um, and I will say that uh, I, I think a lot of people don't quite understand how those opportunities were flying around for guys like us at the time. Uh, because yeah. anyone who had experience during you know, the Afghanistan and Iraq conflicts, anything that was uh, useful, it, basically contractors would come in and try to swipe you up. I was fielding contract offers well into 2010, and I had been out since 2004, uh, mainly due to injury. So it was something where um, it just tends to really – make you think because you have to you really at that moment when you're offered a large sum of money to do something like that you have to be able to make the decision of because it really is kind of a do i want to do this like what am i getting out of this sort of a, a, a proposition so you're doing private security which is um not a rare thing to do at that time and place but certainly uh, rarefied in as much as uh, not everyone gets that opportunity, no matter how skilled they are. So who who were you securing? Like, the, you know, who were we working for? Like, what type of uh, were these high-profile citizens? Was this dignitaries, a combination? What kind of stuff were you doing? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I started out um, looking after this CNN news crew. There was a team of eight of us, and... Mm -hmm. Um, there were two different ways to move around in Baghdad at that time for private security. And mm -hmm. it's what they call high profile and low profile. High profile is when you have, you know, equipment strapped all over your vehicle. You have signs on saying at the back, you know, written in Arabic saying, danger, stay back 100 meters or you'll be shot. What, obviously, what we didn't realize is two, you know, three quarters of Iraq is illiterate. So even though it's written in Arabic, they, they don't understand what right. the signs are. Um, you know, so they, they know your private security. It's high profile. You go out there with the presence. You know, they, they know you're armed. Your, your your vehicles are all kitted up. The other method is to go low profile, which is basically you just drive around in sedans. You 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 dress like a, a local Iraqi. You grow a beard, wear a shamar around your head, wear wear a dish tape, and then underneath that, you've got body armor and you're all tooled up. So. Right. Um, that was I actually found that was a safer way to operate, but you really need experienced operators um, out there. Uh, it, it, it's really like an ex special forces recon type of thing to to do that to just you know drive around Iraq and basically just try and blend in with the local populace. So, um, but I wasn't on that job for very long when the, the comp I worked for one of the larger British companies. Um, I'm not sure if I want to. Say that I don't think it's a real big secret, but I won't say the name now. Um, but I, I worked for one of the larger out. British companies. Uh, I always worked for the same company, um, but I had a number of different jobs over my time. Uh, I was not on that in in that team for very long when they secured a contract to look after. Now this is a British security company. Mm -hmm. They secured a contract to look after two U.S. Army generals. So Major General Mike Jones was a two-star general, and that's the guy I looked after. I can't remember the other guy's name, but he was a three-star general. And they were the heads of the Civilian Police Assistance Training Team, uh, mm -hmm. which was Mike Jones, and the other one was um, uh, the, 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 uh, the Army Assistance Training Team or something. Basically, one general headed up the training of the Iraqi army and one guy headed up the training of Iraqi police. So Jones was the one you looked after, right? Yeah. What year was that, if you don't mind me asking? 08. Okay. <laughs> Reason I... His name is familiar, and due to the, the time... Because I was in until 2004. Um, I know for a fact, if it's the same General Jones that I'm thinking of, I did at least one briefing for him <laughs> at the one yeah. point. Um, but like, it, it's funny like how tight knit uh, intelligence, recon, special forces yes. communities are. You, because we would see a lot of guys from from Britain, Canada, Australia would come through, and we would just bring them all on so what we would be doing um we would there would be new missions going through we'd go through these long briefings like week-long prep 
So you'd have like the, the briefing side of it where you're saying, here's what targets are going to be. Here's where we're going. Here's what we're doing. And then this, the other half of it would be then actually the physical, the equipment prep. So I would be putting on the packs and doing all the recon stuff without the recon pay and showing them how to use our equipment and our methods in that uh, that context. So you yeah. we would have cycles like that. So like every three months we'd rotate out who's doing what and everything. Um, but I, I find it interesting that there's a very good possibility that we work with the same man for, for a bit of time. Um, but tell me what that was like. What was it like looking after General Jones? Like how long were you were you assigned to him? Uh, so he, he was doing a 15 month tour. I was with him for the first nine and then I moved on to a, to another job. But for the, the, the reason I I moved into that role so quickly is that, as I said, the company I worked for um, had secured the contract, but there was a lot of things written into the contract about the type of people um, that they had to populate the team with. Um, you had to have certain experience, certain courses under your belt. So if you were military police close protection trained, um, that the course has got a funny kind of nickname, um, I can't remember what it was, uh, but basically there was a, there was a lot of um, ex-military police guys, British military police who had done the close protection course, um, you know, and either either that or special forces trained close protection. Sure. So once the, my company was awarded the contract, they then turned around and went, "Who have we got who can fit this quite niche criteria?" And there weren't right. that many of us, so they were pulling guys from teams all over the country on all sorts of different contracts. And I just got called up one day and going, you're going to the U.S. Embassy um, to this new job, high profile job. Um, so I remember the, when they first picked me up, it was my first time in the U.S. Embassy, which is not the new U.S. Embassy that was built. This is back when it was Saddam's presidential palace still. And right. they had um, taken over his presidential palace in the green zone to become the U.S. Embassy. And I remember the first time going in there, driving it, like the, the, the team had, uh, picked me up from where I was st currently staying, driven me into the green zone. Just to get into the embassy, you had to get through like, through, like three checkpoints. The first was US Marines. Then there was a triple canopy, which is another security company. They would search your engine bay and a mirror underneath to check for any devices on your vehicle and sure. um, eventually get into, into the, to the embassy itself. And my first experience of the US embassy is – surreal it was my like apocalypse now kind of moment of my career um mm. the presidential palace is enormous it's luxurious we were all staying out the back of the palace in um basically um like demountable buildings just just standard transportable buildings you would go in i think it was two guys to a room um and they were all sandbagged over the top with with concrete bunkers nearby in case we had um indirect fire from over the tigris river Mm -hmm. but um that first night kind of when we'd we'd finished in, in the evening i'm like right i'm gonna go for a walk i'm gonna figure out where the chow hall is and and you walk past the swimming pool at the back of the presidential palace and there are there were like women laying around in bikinis but with a drop leg holster with a with an m9 in it there were soldiers walking around there were all kinds of contractors and reporters and I'm looking around and it's, you know, around seven o'clock at night, it had just gotten dark. And some of the contractors were drinking beer. And I remember a, a black hawk flew overhead and fired some chafe and it was in the night sky and you're seeing palm trees. And then I hear music start and I turn around and look behind the swimming pool and there were all these Americans in cowboy hats and boots, line dancing to country music. <laughs> you know, like M4s and, and I'm like, I'm on another fucking planet. <laughs> this, this is Baghdad 2008 and they're line dancing. There's a, there's a, a coffee shop there. People are getting their Starbucks. And um, so that, that, that was my experience at the, uh, at the embassy, but actually, actually working for, for, for Mike Jones was very interesting. His um, his office was elsewhere in the green zone. Um, mm. So when we would move him there, so again, there were eight guys on the team looking after Mike Jones. We, he also had an aide, um, um, a, 
uh, who who is a, a lovely young lady called Captain. Um, she was Captain Struess at the time. She's now married. She's still she's still in. She's a major now. She's married to a colonel. She's got a beautiful family. Of um, don't speak to her often, you know. But we've stayed friends on Facebook all all these years. Um, That's wonderful. Uh, but yeah, well, basically, we would move the general and his aide around. Um, and if we were just moving him within the green zone, we could do that with um, four four guys and two cars. If we were going outside the green zone, it would go to um, three cars, eight guys, um, more more equipment, more weaponry. Um, but the other benefit of of looking after a, a guy as high profile as a, as a US Major General is that he got the opportunity to, if he wanted to, because he's heading up the police assistance training team, he would want to visit um police training iraqi police training centers there were ones that was yeah. under construction there were ones that were functioning watched them doing the training um so he would travel often via blackhawk so across the road from the u.s embassy was landing zone washington um in the green zone and um we would it, each, each day we'd kind of take turns at, at everyone in my team was versed in each other's role so apart from the team leader um everyone else kind of changed jobs each day. So one day I might be driving the general's car. One day I might be actually his close protection officer for the day, which would mean I would walk everywhere with him and sit in the passenger seat of his car. Another time I might just be driving the lead vehicle and, and helping the, the team leader navigate. So we would change around. Uh, but if it was your... Too. Go that's, ahead, sorry. I, I apologize for interrupting, but that's brilliant because what that does, for those of you that are that are listening or watching that aren't familiar... One of the things that's difficult to maintain in any sort of operational group is making sure that in the event that the worst happens, that order and consistency are maintained. So you do have a lot of tendency in special forces, Marine Corps, things like that, Navy SEALs, things like that, uh, and obviously with this private contracting as well, to make sure everyone knows how to do everything else in case something happens. But when, you're, but when you think about that in practice, uh, it's not something that, immediately comes to mind that you will also make it a point to physically rotate that job so that one you're always training you're always in a sense of training yeah. and you also have um because I, I would assume that because you're changing that job all the time it lessens the possibility that you'll get complacent or be off of the edge do you find that that helped with that or did even the rotation become routine um that was actually one of the main reasons we did it because if you had someone who was always driving the rear vehicle, that guy will start to come become complacent when he's doing that. Um, right. So that that was uh, it, it. Was it really was it, it had the, the two benefits, like you say, of constantly being in this training cycle, um, but also preventing that complacency because complacency really can creep in quite easily when you're over there for a long period of time. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, it's been quite uneventful for several months. Like, you know, all the, all the you, you know, this, all the war movies you see, the one thing they've never been able to depict is the fact that war is actually 99% boredom, 1% sheer terror. 99% of the time, you are bored as hell, man. You're chain smoking yeah. cigarettes, drinking coffee. Uh, I used to try and get all that, uh, that, that Dunkin' Donuts stuff off the Americans. I, I fell in love with Dunkin' Donuts coffee when I was over there. <laughs> I, I actually, program. to this day... I have uh, two pounds of beans in bags behind me. Uh, by the yep. way, chat, this is a green screen behind me. That's not really my office behind me. That is my old office. But uh, yep. yeah, it, it, once you get that bug, that particular kind of coffee, nothing else will do. I'm sorry. Um, yep. But yeah, so you were doing the rotations and uh, you know we were talking about green zone versus not green zone. And just to make it perfectly plain, green zone more or less refers to not quite safe, but safe, but less dangerous than everything else. And once you go outside of that, there's a lot less uh, guarantee of um, uh, sympathetic forces being nearby, backup, things like that. There's perhaps uh, less intel of knowing where enemies are. It's more unpredictable. It's more dangerous. So you need to have a more augmented presence to ensure that as a self-contained group, you have less to worry about. Uh, that's yeah. more, would that... Does that work for you in terms of an explanation? Yeah, yeah. And just just to add to that, the, the green zone, I think it was around 14 square kilometers. But basically, it was like 
you know, the Beverly Hills of, of Baghdad is where Saddam mm -hmm. and his sons had all their palaces. So the coalition forces had basically put a ring of concrete all the way around these like 12 foot high concrete T walls that they craned in um, with um, checkpoints at all their kind of entries and exits. So it was a lot safer in, in the green zone. But as soon as you stepped out, like for me, there's, there's, there's a road that was codenamed Route Irish, which ran from the green zone to the BIAP, the Baghdad International Airport, um, which obviously people have to transit a lot because that's the airport that brings people into the country. So sure. because of that, it became known as the most dangerous road in the world, Route Irish. Um, yes. I don't know how many times I've driven Route Irish, and it is a terrifying experience. Terrifying. It's it's only about seven kilometer distance, um, but you will, you know, all the rules of the road go out the window. You know, you will. It's a three lanes each way. I think it is. You know, it's a work like a. a um, a dual, what we call a dual carriageway in, in the United States, uh, uh, sorry, in the United Kingdom. Um, so three lanes traveling one way, three lanes traveling the other. And we would cross over and drive into traffic, firing flares at cars to get them to move out of the way. If, um, you know, if, if we were concerned, we were getting bogged down. Um, um, yeah, so an experience. I, I have never, I've never once heard a relaxing story about Rude Irish, not once. No. Um, and again, for perspective of those that may not have similar experience, imagine for a second that you are an insurgent um, or just a, a nationalist that's really not happy with the state of affairs or someone just looking to make trouble. And you want to make sure that you can station yourself in a place where you can do a lot of damage with relative ease and not a lot of waiting. Well, what you do is you set up shop along route Irish because you're bound to get someone important going back and forth there. If you shoot enough things, uh, you know, you want to talk about a target rich environment. Uh, it's insane. So you have to be dry, whether you're driving to or from you, I would assume it's not just the traffic aspect, but then you don't know what's along the sides because you're trying to get from point a to point B as quickly and efficiently as possible to minimize the stuff you can't see. And it's not fun. Like I, buddies of mine that did similar things that, that you were doing, what they used to always tell me was like, dude, I would rather have just run headlong naked through a minefield because the odds are a lot better. Yeah. That was kind of their, their at least conceptually, uh, for the simple fact that there's just that much more of a chance that something's going to happen because it makes too much sense. If you want to cause trouble, that's where you go. Um, so as you know, we're talking about all these different things uh, as, it, as it relates to General Jones. Uh, and although I don't want to cut that story short, I'm sure that there is more. Um, yep. What would you say would be the next most notable assignment in chronological order and what that entailed? Well, I only had one more after that, but I'm just going to quickly read Sal's um, super chat here. Thank you, Sal. Um, Sal is actually currently active duty, so ma massive respect to him. Um, he says, show my love for the most handsome operator in the game. He's talking about you there, Jim. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Palm death. That's it. And, and, and end, of, end of answer right there. It's very simple. Okay. And, oh, uh, and Grody here says, Grindhead Jim, he loves your interviewing style. I knew I was I, bringing the right guy onto the channel for this. I appreciate <laughs> that, guys. Um, so after, after, after my time on the close protection team from Major General Mike Jones, I only had one kind of one other. I did, I moved around locations and I worked my, my way kind of up through the ranks, but I, I mo then moved on to, um, well, I started to hear word that, again, the, the company I was on, they had a lot of different contracts. Their biggest contract um, was called Project Matrix. Mm -hmm. And Project Matrix was working in support of, the reconstruction effort. So it was working for the US Arm, Army Corps of Engineers, which mm -hmm. when you and I think, because I was a, an engineer, a combat engineer when I was in the Australian Army. So right. I'm trying to understand, I was like, why are they hiring like 800 contractors to look after the US Army Corps of Engineers? But then when you get there, you realize there aren't that many soldiers. These are all right. State Department guys. They're civil engineers who are, mm -hmm. you know, combat engineers 
They build bridges. They clear landmines. They do demolitions. Build expedient obstacles. stuff, right. Versus, yeah, they remove obstacles to get the infantry where they need to go. Where this is more like the military equivalent of municipal construction. Uh, yes. It, so it, it's very much a hybrid of civilian and military. So you're, you, civilians doing military stuff in tandem with that kind yeah. of operational tempo and efficiency. But by and large, as you're saying, it's a lot of civilians, which when you hear Army Corps of Engineers, it just doesn't quite make sense yeah. initially. Um, so what, what was that like? That Because you're mentioning how that's kind of a culture shock to begin with. What was the experience like once you settled past that? So they had bases all over Iraq where mm -hmm. um, and, and each basically each base was assigned a province or two provinces. You know, Iraq is separated by provinces where America is always separated by states, that kind of thing. Sure. And the, va the vast majority of the guys working on this contract were in what they called set teams, security escort teams. So not exactly bodyguarding, more like a, an armored taxi service. Right. But I, I, I'll be honest, like, as I had a massive amount of respect for Mike Jones, but I started to get a little bit bored in, in that role. Um, and I heard about reconstruction liaison teams. And what and this was a, a concept um, kind of drawn up by an ex-German Special Forces guy who worked for my company. He developed the concept and proposed this. Um, to the USDOD, and they're like, hey, we, we like the idea of this. So a reconstruction liaison team is made up of four or five expats. So we were mostly British. I did have um, an, an American on my team. At one, actually, I had an American for most of the time there. He was my second in command, a, uh, an ex-Marine tank commander called Dallas Morris. Uh, and, uh, of course, he's from Texas. <laughs> of course he is. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, his son, his son he's named his son Jim Bowie, I think. <laughs> um, but basically, the, the, the team was made up of like five expatriates. Um, so a team leader, a 2IC, a medic, and then a couple of other operators. And then we would recruit our own local Iraqis and train them um, in weapon handling, driving, um, this kind of thing. Sure. And our job was to go out... Um, almost like a reconnaissance type element. So I, I worked across three different provinces. Um, the most dangerous one being Maysan province with Alamara city, which is right on the Iranian border. Um, that I'm familiar with it. Yeah. yeah there, there was, there was, um, um, Fob Gary Owen in, in the early part of the war, that was actually part of the British area. It was just North of Basra. Uh, the right. Brits were in there in the early part of the, the war. When I got there, it had, um, transition had handed over to the Americans and actually MPs were up there. It was now a, a military police unit was there. Plus, you know, like an ODA attachment. Um, for, for visualization purposes, Tony, give, give the audience an idea of how much of an area, how many square kilometers or square miles were we dealing with with these provinces? What? Well, so I was based at, um, <sighs> Uh, it was what, what what's the what's the acronym for um, american air bases you know like a, a fobs a forward operating base what do they do for air bases oh it depends upon who's running it <laughs> yeah and anyway it, um, it was codenamed anaconda um, so if it was naval it would be an nas um afb for air force and then uh AFB you know, that, yeah, no, no, sorry, AFB. it was air, yeah, air, air, force, force, air force base anaconda in Talil. That was in yeah. um, the southern part of Dikar province. So mm -hmm. Dikar was kind of in, in the middle. Maysan was off to the east and um, Samawa, I think it was, which, which was a very safe kind of province. We didn't have to go there very often. Sure. But for me to travel from uh, Air Force Base Anaconda up to Fob Gary Owen, which is where we would stay for a few nights when we did a mission into Alamara, that was a 270-kilometer drive to get there. So that's 270 kilometers, you know. So just over 90 you. minutes each way, right? Mm hmm Just about a little over 100 minutes each way, you figure? Oh, a bit, a, a bit longer than that because it would take a while to get through Nazaria City. Um, right, 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 so, right. I'm thinking know, highway. I'm thinking freeway driving, and I'm not thinking military. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, you know, when, when we were out um, at, kind of out in the desert, it's, it's not exactly a freeway. It's just a, a two-lane right. road. 
um, but sure. there's not a lot of traffic between population areas. So we can travel at about 100 kilometers. I think the co our company actually had a, um, I think we actually had a, 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 a law base, a, a, not a law, like a, a rule. Unless we were in contact, we could never go over 100 kilometers an hour out there just to, because our vehicles were so heavy with all the additional armor in them. If you, uh, you know, we had a big problem with, with tire blowouts, particularly oh, in the yeah. summer when it gets up to over 50 degrees Celsius. Like that's fucking hot, man. And tires would just pop. Um, yeah. Yeah. You, you pop a tire at 100 Ks and you're, you're in an armored vehicle that's three and a half ton. They you don't, I don't care how good a driver you are. Yeah. So they're going. So, yeah, so it, it, it was it was a massive massive area that we covered. Um, I remember one time um, we were doing a lot of work around Alamara City in Maysan because they were building a police station there. There was an eighty bed surgical hospital being built just outside the town. Mm -hmm. um, there was a bridge and a road being built. There's a lot of a lot of key kind of projects going on, but also further out past Alamara City was a lot of the old um, Iraqi oil rigs that were no longer functioning, you know, getting oil out of the ground. And there was a lot of talk that it was so close to the Iranian border that the Iranians were doing what they call slant drilling, where they drill down in Iran and then go on an angle and they're actually sucking oil out of Iraq. I don't know how true, if it's a conspiracy theory, but it created a lot of tension on the Iraq-Iran border. Sure. And I was asked to go one day out to this area. And I was even speaking to like the ODA guys in Fob Gary Owen, um, you know, about what the atmospherics are like out, out in this, this particular part of the border. And he's like, dude, no one's been out there for ages. You, you shouldn't be going. And I'm like, I'm relaying this back to my headquarters. And they're like, no, we need to get out there. We need to get these oil rigs up and running. What they wanted me to do was, was to get out there just initially, like, you know, make a few points of contact, um, get a phone number for, for a, maybe a maintenance manager or something at one of these rigs, kind of see who's around. And and um, I, I wouldn't say we got lost because I don't get lost. I, you know, right. I, we're always somewhere, but the maps that we had were quite old. Right. And apparently the border has moved. That happens a lot and they don't tend to send out any newsletters to let you know. Yeah, yeah, and um, very fortunate we didn't um, didn't start a uh, an international incident by getting fired on. But we had we had weapons pointed at us by by the Iranians, and I was like, I can poof, back out. And then as we were backing out, traveling back down this this road, um, we were then arrested by um, I can't remember what the name of the, the unit was. Um, it, it was like an, an Iraqi kind of border force. They were they weren't army, they weren't police, but they were a government kind of security agency. And yeah, we, we were driving back um, back from here. It was like, hey, we've got fucking that, that border's not where it's supposed to be. Let's just right. get out of here. And, right. uh, and we had basically travelled a, a, a long way down a road that didn't turn off anywhere. So it's like got to go all the way back. And obviously, this had been communicated back to the Iraqi border forces. So as I'm tra as I'm traveling back down the road with my team, we we come across a couple of like uh, Iraqi pickup trucks. They're aiming PKMs at us. They're all out with AKs. Like everybody get out. Um, I start to walk towards them. You know, I've I've got my weapon, but I've got it just slung from my rifle. I don't even have my hand on the pistol grip. Um, no helmet to kind of show a slightly um, less threatening posture. Um, yeah. But I know I've got some badasses right behind me. Should didn't go wrong. Um, but as I started to walk forward, a few of them cocked their weapons and it was very, very tense and trying to get my um, interpreter to explain. And they, they they were accusing us of being CIA and trying to cause an incident on the border. And um, basically we, we, we ended up, um, we ended up in jail cells for, for a little while. Um, took a, took a while to get us out of there. So Iraqi jails at like club med or. Oh, I see it, it, like the jail cells back at the headquarters, but yeah, not yeah. not nice, man. The place stunk of shit. You know, they've got the they use the toilets over there where they just just squat and um, I had one in the in there. It was it smelled disgusting. We were given horrible food to eat. I lost. I was in there. I think three days, three days before my my my, my company kind of got us out. 
Um, no, no, no abuse or anything like that. You know, we weren't we weren't beaten. It was just horrendous living conditions, really, and and you know, dirty rice is kind of all, all I remember eating for a few days, but. So oh, certainly good. during during that three days, you were like, oh, so that's why it's one hundred seventy thousand dollars. I get it now. Oh, okay. Uh, well, um, <laughs> that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough for that. <laughs> it was, it's like, hey, boss, it's time to renegotiate my quarterly bonus here. Okay. Yeah. That was out of yeah. hand. All right. <laughs> get me exactly. a freaking good map next time. Okay. Thanks. Really appreciate yeah. that. Um. So that definitely gives a at least from my perspective, a good idea of like kind of the gamut of what you were doing, what kind of informed the types of things you were asked to do. Uh, we know how your care, your, your strength of character was formed, how that started and how basically all of these experiences just serve to either strengthen um, or have a person take a divergent path. And certainly uh, I don't think that uh, there's any doubt about the fact that you've only grown and strengthened like tempered steel throughout this time. I don't think there's any question about that. And I have a lot of respect for you, man. And, and you know, hats off to you, brother. I can't, I'm wearing headphones, but you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so I do want to kind of get into some of the fun parts of this stuff, things that people will want to know. Because on a long enough timeline here, in a very few short months, apparently, they're going to be able to hold, you know, a plastic version of you in their hand. And what I want to talk about is we've heard a lot about the customized weapons and what you wear um, and, and how that kind of informs the figure. But what I want to know is how that evolution looks, what changes were made, why were they made, and when they were changed again, why were they made? So like, let's, let's kind of go from, if you'll permit me, basically from the feet all the way to the top of your head and tell me over time what like what you started with what changed and why you changed it so that we then end up at where desert rat is today as immortalized in plastic because i think that the more people know about that the more invested they're going to be in the action force character of desert rat yeah so um we weren't issued too much equipment we were issued with body armor that was um very uh what's the word i'm looking for it was like 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 level four ballistic plates but there were more expensive products on the market that were gave you just as much protection but were, were lighter in weight because they were expensive they, they wouldn't do that so I mean, when i first got out there the company issued us um all nomex flight suits because they're fire retardant uh, which is good if, if your vehicle's hit by an id it often catches fire mm -hmm. um but a lot of guys go out and, and start buying a lot of their, their own equipment. Um, I remember one of the key differences when I was on Major General Jones's team, most private security companies in Iraq are allowed to carry pistols and rifles, and they are allowed to have smoke grenades and flashbangs and flares, but they can't have fragmentation grenades, anything like that. Um, really? as private private security is not not allowed at, at that time anyway. I think uh, I think in in the real early days, like going back to oh three oh four, it was whatever you could get it on the black market. You know, yeah, um, that's why it's surprising because that was the tell I was hearing was that it was almost a free for all in the private sector it, around that time. Yeah, it, it it was in the early days, but it had become a lot more regulated by kind of two thousand seven two thousand eight. Sure. Um, but well, and also. But, companies were losing contracts because of some of the behavior of their contractors. Right. Um, you, you hear a lot of things about like Blackwater, stuff like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there, there was even been some controversial incidents um, linked to my, the company I worked for. Um, uh, nothing to, you know, it was, it was a big company. A lot of people, it was nothing I was ever involved in, but there, um, there, there, there was, there was a YouTube video that got posted years ago um, of a vehicle from my company driving around Baghdad with the guy in, in the in the rear gunner seats are facing backwards, literally just taking pot shots at anything as he was dri driving around and the idiots mm. put it on YouTube. Like, um, right. so, so, so when I was on my major general, Mike Jones's team though, there, there was an exception to that rule for us because of what we were doing. Um, so we basically had free reign of the U S armory. So 
Our sidearms were M9s because it was what we were issued, but um, I really was not a fan of the M9. I didn't even want to carry it because I found it so unreliable uh, that it was dangerous. Um, maybe it's just the one I was issued, but I, I couldn't fire a full magazine through an M9 without it getting stoppages. Um, it was horrendous. Yeah, I was going to ask. It was because the jams, right? Because they notoriously yeah. jam. Yeah. Um, but I carried an M4 with an M203. So in the early days, I was obviously carrying a lot of 40 millimeter grenades. I had smoke grenades, um, fragmentation grenades for the 40 millimeter. Um, that was kind of my, my, my standard weapon system. I don't remember what boots I was wearing initially when I went out there. Um, probably just British Army issue desert boots. Mm -hmm. And I don't know at what point, but a lot of the american bases you would have the px and there'd be a taco bell and um yeah oh, as surreal as that, that is yeah um is it is it cinnabon yeah cinnabon yeah man i've never had a cinnabon before i reckon i've eaten 500 of those in my time in iraq i love cinnabon. <laughs> we don't get they're, them here they're in Australia. insane it, yeah. it all it's just cake dough in a spiral with this demonic white I'm not going to say the word that we use to describe it. Cover <laughs> the, the bun. It tastes good. <laughs> it it does. And then yeah. you know, heaven forbid, you have any of it left on your on your face when you get back to unit. Be like, well, where have you been? Hmm? Yeah, yeah. What have yeah. you been doing? <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, a, a lot of the bases around these PXs that you know they, they would have they would have the barber shop. There might be sure. a, a Pizza Hut, or there would definitely be a Green Bean. A Green Bean was a, a um, what's it it's, 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 a, it's a coffee shop, but um, isn't it? You know, like all the all the funds go to for vets or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't remember the exact thing, but yeah, you never saw Starbucks or anything. It was always the green bean. But a lot of these sure. places also have an Oakley shop, and you were able to buy everything Oakley in there tax free. You know, at the time, Oakley was very smart. You know, they're known as a sunglass company. They started making tactical gear, backpacks. Um, yeah. gloves, all this kind of thing. And the best pair of desert boots I've ever owned were were um, were Oakley desert boots. They had a number of different types. I don't remember the specific one. And I they were, I would you know, I'd get about a year out of them before they needed to be replaced. And um, but that was the first key change was fight because you you you're ex military. You know how com how important it is in any role in the military to have comfortable footwear. On on a different show in a different time, remind me to tell you my boots story because it's a long and involved one for sure. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So so Oakley boots. Um, this this shirt that I'm wearing here, this is a five eleven tactical shirt. So mm -hmm. we had the option of wearing these shirts um, with five eleven tactical trousers or the Nomex flight suit. So depending on the mission, sometimes I would wear the, the now the fight the the, the the 511 Tactical is not Nomex. It's not fire retardant. So it has that against it. Um, but certainly when I was getting into kind of the liaison type side of the job. So I, I would go into different areas and talk to everyone from local sheikhs, police chiefs, members of the council, um, because all of these construction projects were stalling and quite often – the Iraqis were their own worst enemy. They would want a hospital to be built, right. but they had an issue with the company that was hired to build it because maybe they were Sunni and they were Shia or there was a tribal thing or or yeah. there was all this construction going on, but no one there was getting um, any employment. So I would come in and try and mediate this type of stuff. So if I was going to a quite high-profile meeting, um, I would often wear the 511 because it's a collared shirt and it just it looks a little bit more presentable, looks a little bit more looks professional. Smart. So. Yeah. yeah so, so even if the rest of my team was kind of wearing the nomex i could arrive i could take off the body armor and i would come in you know and i'd have a, a collared shirt tucked in and i would present a much more um more, more professional look as opposed to um you know the badass ag aggressive you know I, right I, I, I was one of the first guys in my company to um to to not wear a helmet very often. And then later on in, in the conflict around 2010, I would, I would wear body armor whenever I traveled, but I would get to locations and I would, I would get out and I would just literally walk around with a sidearm and a shirt and trousers. 
So uh, do, you, do you attribute do you attribute that to uh, a familiarity, or was that tactical? Like, like because I, I understand that perception is everything, especially when you're in a foreign land. Doesn't matter how long you've been there, who you're dealing with, uh, people will take your stock at a glance. So, what led to that kind of habit of taking off the armor in certain situations? It. After you've worked in the same, as I said, I, I moved around a little bit. I spent my first kind of year in contracting in and around Baghdad, often nine months in and around Baghdad, then spent a brief period in Diwaniya, but then I moved down to Talil and we were looking after mm. these three provinces. Um, I stayed there for the next three years. I became incredibly familiar with the town. I, I was able to read atmospherics is what we the British terminology, you, you read the atmospherics. Um, there were just little things I would I would pick up on when I would go into an area. I could tell whether it was hostile or not. And the, the reason I would start to remove my, my body armor is I, I found I was much... Also, by that time, I'd start to learn quite a lot of Arabic. I was almost an intermediate level speaker of, of Arabic. It's, it's, it's kind of got, gone a bit now, but, um, you know, I haven't spoken it in 10 years, but I speak a bit of Arabic. Mm -hmm. um, so by being able to go into these areas and where they're so used to seeing these guys coming in in body armor, often with helmets, um, um, a lot of a lot of coalition guys would even shake an Iraqi's hand with their glove on. Uh, I was always, uh, the further along I went, I would literally, I, I had confidence in, in myself that even if anything did happen, I could get myself from there to my vehicle while the rest of my team were so well trained, you know, they, they would cut, they would cut, cause it would only be me and my interpreter. Once I got back to my vehicle, I had everything I needed anyway. Um, if, if, if we got into a, into a contact. So it, it, I became well, one of the best guys at developing relationships because of the way I presented myself. So it was a combination of, being there a long time and really understanding the atmospherics and, and knowing when an area was, it's like my spider sense, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't yeah. explain a lot of it. It's just, you develop it over time. Exactly. And it's something, it, what I would refer to as situational awareness is what I would call it. Yeah. And I was making a joke with my buddy, Rob, when we were driving down to this convention, I was at uh, this past weekend. I says, you have to understand that I'm going into a place that is run by some of my best friends, I'm never going to be away from someone that I know. But know that every room we go into, I'm going to scan the room, find the exits, and look for things I can improvise into weapons. I don't have a choice. That's just how my brain is wired. And I didn't see anything nearly as intense as you did. But when you do something often enough and you're and it's just beat into your head often enough, it just becomes second nature. And I was hoping that you were going to lead me to the fact that after a long enough time in country, you have to be able to read uh, not necessarily what is happening, but also what you need to do in order to get what you need out of the people around you, the perception, the presentation of it. Because uh, when you hold, walk hold up on, to someone... Sorry, Jim, one yeah. second. Michael Schaefer, get that cunt Kirk out of this fucking chat right now. He's gone. Sorry, Jim. Oh, you're Someone's crazy. calling me a drone for a corrupt government, so I'm bouncing. Oh, that's always fun, isn't that great? Yeah, yeah. Fuck off. <laughs> um, sorry. So, um, what what I was getting at saying the word as well. <laughs> not to you, Jim, but the audience. I'm sure you're fine with it. <laughs> no, I'm not worried about it at all. It was um, warranted in that situation. I completely agree. It is. It is one of my favorite words in in small order. Um, yeah. because it has bite to it. But apologies to anybody. Um, so what we were getting at was that when you go into a situation where you're dealing with people that are, no matter how long you're in there, no matter what your mission is, you are not from there. You are, for all intents and purposes, still from an invading force perceptively. So you, anything that you can do to, um, to soften for lack of a better word, the way that you look and the way you can prevent your, uh, present yourself professionally in a way that is cooperative 
and collaborative rather than uh, aggressively or confrontationally um, tends to, to, to be really important. Uh, a lot of the guys that I trained with, you know, for counter intel stuff, we talked about that and the psychology of making sure that you're presenting the right way for the right audience. And it, it's clear that, you know, shunning the body armor and the heavier weapons in certain situations for the atmospherics was developed for that reason. Would you say that's true? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, which is really interesting because the further you go along, you know, we've talked about, you've got those, those Oakley boots, you have the two different outfits that you go for, you know, tactical versus the flight gear. Um, and, and certainly you had mentioned that the original body armor you had was really, it was kind of bulky. It was effective, but it was heavier and bulkier. Um, yes. How long before you were like, the hell with this, I want something else? Three weeks, my first paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> I, my I had a paycheck. feeling it was going to be that. And I, and, I, and I went out and bought, um, you know, I, I spoke to a lot of other guys there. Nearly everyone had their own body armor. So oh, sure. I was trying on di different stuff. And I, could, I had to purchase it from the States and get it shipped to... Um, um, Get it, get it shipped out, but mail was relatively quick over there. Um, get, getting mail from from the states, mm -hmm. um, and I ended up going for um, a brand called Paraclete, and this is the same body armor I bought all those years ago. This this Paraclete, I've owned this body armor since yeah oh seven oh eight. Um, fantastic piece of equipment. There's probably you know better brands of body armor out and around now. Um, you know, obviously, things you know. Product development things improve over time, um, but this has yeah. uh, never done me wrong, and and I'm very lucky that I was actually able to get this back into Australia when I left as well. Yeah, yeah, because you you hear a lot about that, uh, because for Americans, you may recall that when the war first broke out, there was such a shortage of of good armor plates that families were buying plates in bulk and sending it overseas to their their kids, and these were for basic infantry men and women. You know what I mean? It's it's crazy, uh, but then when they would come back in, they would get the armor inserts confiscated because it was they weren't allowed to have it uh, in in yeah. certain places. And I would assume with Australia, it's the same thing. Yeah, so, it's against our firearm laws to to be able to own it. But um, really, yeah. I, I I shipped a, a lot of stuff back here, and the, the the one thing Australian customs had an issue with is I had a genuine reindeer pelt from my time doing Arctic warfare in Sweden. Um, Australia is very concerned about um, flora and fauna and, and that kind of like you can't bring certain fruits and foods in, into the even moving into state in Australia they're very strict around that they don't want the spread of fruit fly and and things so yeah so that they completely ignored this level four body armor and had an issue right. with my reindeer pelt <laughs> <laughs> like those pears no mate you can't have that all oh, armor's yeah. fine no 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 those or no no oranges <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. it's I, I mean, I get it, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, it sounds like, you know, government for me. So yeah. um, there's a super chat that actually relates to my next question. Uh, so perfect. So yeah. uh, King Eric is asking, Tony, did you prefer the F88 over the M4 or vice versa? And also thanks both of us for service. Quite welcome. And he would love to visit Australia someday. Oh, that's good, King Eric. Um, so the F-88 is the Australian style, um, mm -hmm. F-88 style org. Um, I, I, I prefer them. The M4 is my my favourite weapon system. Um, right. I don't like the F-88. The F-88 is not a bad weapon. Like, it's, it's superior to the British SA-80. But the similarities between those two is that they are both bullpup rifles, and I am not a fan of bullpup rifles. Um, for those who don't know what bullpup is, it means it's where the magazine is situated behind the pistol grip as opposed to in front of it. Right. So with the M4, um, a lot of people are going to know that term from various video games, films, things like that. Um, I've always kind of looked at it as just by virtue of its utility and how many people will point to that as a reliable weapon. It's kind of like the smaller, like the, the submachine gun kind of next generation of like, say the AK in terms of AK is one of those weapons that it just works. And the M4 has a lot of utility to it. Um, 
what kind of led to the customization of the M4? And can you walk us through from from butt to barrel? What was yep. changed? How it affected the weapon? What and and what experiences led to those changes? Because you know this isn't something where you're just going into a workshop and say, "Well, I want it to be this color, and I like this because it look it works for me in the way that my eyes work." It's not really co- not necessarily cosmetic. There tends to be you encounter a problem that you have to solve or there's a shortcoming of, of your particular weapon because no two weapons are exactly the same, even though they're all yep. mass produced. So what kind of led to these changes and, 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 and when you get to the final form of the M4 that is now going to be immortalized on the figure, what you like best about that weapon as it exists in, the, in that form? So um, I, I tried for a while with a, um, with a front foregrip. A lot of guys would have a front foregrip, so you basically ho- kind of hold the weapon like that. Right. Um, I, I, I just I never found that comfortable. Um, it's awkward, actually. And with yeah, anything- I, I, I prefer a supportive posture for, for, for my front hand for the rifle to, to lay on. Uh, I, I find I'm a, a far more accurate shot like that so um so i tried that for a while and, and, and kind of got rid of it even though a lot of other guys carried them but I, I think part of that though as well you could get these four grips that had a like a s- small spring-loaded bipod underneath um and it was just good to let that out and and put your weapon down when you're loading a vehicle or whatever and, and stop it from getting dirty so <laughs> i think the guys like used, used it for that application but um the the biggest change to to my weapon system as I, I purchased a, um, a shorter barrel, um, purchased it from the States. It was amazed that I was able to get it shipped out to Iraq, but I, I was, I think the only thing we couldn't get shipped out was, um, the trigger mechanism housing. Um, that's, right. you know, when you have the hammer and the, the fire and the, and the bolt and stuff, but other parts of weapons, they would happily ship because without the trigger mechanism and the firing pin and the bolt, it's not a, a weapon. So, right. Exactly. Um, the number one reason for that is getting in and out of vehicles was so difficult with the longer barrel. Um, tink, tink. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I would have liked all the guys in, in my team to have short barrels, but, you know, I was prepared to spend several hundred dollars and, and buy my own. They were. Other places I'd work, guys were actually issued Bushmasters, which mm-hmm. were short barrel. When I was in d I carried a short barrel Bushmaster, then when I arrived down in Talil, they gave us longer barreled M4s. Um, so that's so, so the, the, the sole purpose of the, of the short barrel is, is for moving in and out of vehicles. But also, I was always the one who would be going into buildings. Um, in the British military, we, we, we have a term called fibula, which is fighting in built up areas. Mm-hmm. Um, or CQB, sometimes the special forces call it close quarter battle. Yeah. Um, but we would arrive at locations and the majority of my team would stay outside on security. I'm the one who's got to go inside. It's all a shorter barrel is also good for room clearance, getting around corners. The, the shorter your weapon system, the, the better. Um, and in addition to that, that to do, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's all right. to elaborate on that, the shorter barrel too would also help as you are clearing a room, the radius at which you're shot at yeah. because the longer barrel you can take faster wider swaths with a shorter barrel and cover the distance efficiently with a longer barrel what what you and again this is you know this but for them yeah you have to go slower with a longer barrel because it's further out and if you go too fast you're not going to be able to instinctively pull if you have to um do you find that that's also part of it did did did, did the way that you held the weapon and, and the attitude of it okay yeah so you yeah, were saying, I'm sorry. Absolutely. No, and uh, so also the, the, the final version. So um, I particularly like the ACOG site. Um, the ACOG oh, yeah. was, was an optic that we used in the, in the British military as well. It's a very, very um, good optic. But I f- found that I always – thought that the most dangerous situations I was getting myself into um, were always at very, very close range. Mm -hmm. In buildings, near buildings, in crowded areas. Um, 
an ACOG's not good for that type of environment. It's uh, any kind of, of lensed optic restricts your peripheral vision. Right. Um, so I had, I got a set of flip up rear iron sights that I attached to my weapon. And the one that's Bobby has created for the action figure, you've got the ACOG on there and the rear iron sight. And what I would do, the ACOG would be attached the whole time we're kind of driving around in vehicles out in the desert ready for a long range engagement mid to long um, range stuff from a fixed position more or less yeah yep then if i was to arrive at one of these uh, meetings i was going to have with, with someone i've got to go into a building um as i would pull up if i mean if if i'd been there before and the atmospherics were good i would probably just go in with a sidearm but i also had to go into a lot of areas where you know my ass was a little bit tight that day you know <laughs> <laughs> right up the muscle, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not 100 sure here. Like, right, I'm, I'm taking my M4 into this one. Um, I would remove the ACOG, leave it in the vehicle, and just go in with the iron sights because sure. I would be much better prepared for a close quarter engagement. Um, other things I did with that weapon, um, I changed out the pistol grip. Um, you know, people could say it's cosmetic because I, I, I got a nice like um, coyote tan colored pistol grip. Partly cosmetic. I mean, I painted the short about I painted parts of the weapon as well. Um, but the main reason I, I changed the different pistol grip, I had fired a friend's weapon on the range one day who had this particular type of pistol grip that was slightly different shape. And I just found it incredibly comfortable. And I was like, well, what pistol grips that? Where did you buy it? And went online and, and ordered one. Um, and the same with um, the butt stock. Um, so on the, on the M4, the buttstock is, is adjustable. It's it's fully closed, and then it's got two positions. Um, you can slot it out to, or you can just fully remove it. Um, again, I got I got a, a coyote tan buttstock, um, but the main reason I got that is I got one with a, a Picatinny rail on it. Um, on on the buttstock, for one reason only, is I used to do a lot of videoing down at the range. And uh, this is in the days before GoPro, but actually right. you've seen that, that trailer at the start. There's a, a shot of me running. I've got, I've got this um, camera. I don't remember what the camera was called. It was a small, it looked like a, um, um, a small torch, but it had a long mm -hmm. cable running to a power pack that would fit into a magazine pouch. Um, so I, I, could have, I could have that on the Picatinny rail at the front, uh, kind of facing back towards me. But right. if I wanted to um, film what I was shooting at, I preferred to have it on the buttstock. So you, because I would actually go back and, and watch my own hand movements of doing magazine changes and forward assist and cocking the weapon. Um, so you needed a camera mounted here. So that literally for, uh, for, for documentary purposes is why I purchased the stock because there was nothing wrong with the stock it came with. So it's a camera tripod for a gun. Pretty much, basically. yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got uh, a here from... 42. thanks for the super chat he says i still have my body armor i ordered for afghan and iraq i was able to fly it back to my in my squadron's plane also green bean profits went to mwr um what's what's mwr i've heard the acronym a billion times and it's just i'm i i can make a billion guesses and they'll probably all be wrong yeah it's something yeah. very nice i know that much <laughs> um and his work work and his wife works for Aves. AFES. AFES, yeah. Which is that's the um Army Air Force Exchange Service. So that's all the PX stores yeah, that yeah. are out there. Yeah. So you'll you'll find those on your larger army bases, some air force bases, a lot of reserve. Um yeah. and it yeah. But uh that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that uh comment. Um so we've basically we've covered the the your M4 from but to you know to 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 barrel there. Um yeah. so I we all know about ye old scarf. I know there's a billion different ways that people like to, to call them, but they always I always call them scarves. I've always, you know. Um do, do were, was that originally just for protection from the elements um for you? Or, yeah, or, or, I mean, I've, um, yeah, so, so the British Army, we, we call this a, a shamar and, and like going all the way, I started to carry one back on my days in selection. Um, 
where, you know, we would be traveling around the Welsh mountains. It would be very windy, very cold. And it was really, really very, very comfortable. So um, a lot of the time in, um, in Iraq, like January, February, um, people would actually be surprised at how cold that country gets. It does, um, though. Desert yeah, in and general. Like, like, like the, the, the wind chill factor. So I would always carry a, a shamar, um, as I, I mentioned on that reveal with Bobby. Um, I had a med pouch at the back, and I just had right. two elastic loops, and I would roll it up, sit it there. Again, for a number of reasons. When you sit down in a vehicle and you've got body armor on and the body armor is making you sit forward, you end up with this void in your lower back. And if you don't have something there to support it, um, you're going to get a bad back very quickly. So that yeah. was comfortable there. It was kind of easy to, to access. But the, the Shamar also has a lot of other uses. It can be used for a triangular bandage very easily. Um, I would pull it out on the range when you want to pick up your brass. You just lay a Shamar out, throw all your brass on there, pick it up like a, a, a sack. And, yeah, well, you have all sorts of uses for a, for a Shamar. And uh, may, maybe maybe it goes back to all the way to childhood, you know, and you've got your favourite blankie and you like to suck on it. At night. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it, there is a certain degree of uh, – with equipment it's i think it's in any line of work but especially in the military um you t my father always told me you take care of your tools they'll take care of you type of situation and when you find something that works i i think that people that have to do a job you get very stubborn to change when it comes to the way in which you like to work once you find that that process uh, it tends to stick with you and i don't think that necessarily you went into the shema with i can do all these things with it you got it for one purpose, and then a new problem exactly. presented itself in the Shema. I was like, I'm right here. I can I can do that. I'm good yep. at this. Um, I think that's one of the coolest things about the military, because a lot of people at a glance would think, well, if you need this for this, this for this, this for this, why not just have something that does each of those jobs? Every single thing that you carry is weight on the in, in, in the pack when you're moving around. And, you know, it's a lot about being able to move efficiently and not wearing yourself out, just walking around. Because if something does happen, uh, you need to be able to move quickly and efficiently and not wear yourself out. Because no matter what good of shape you're in, if you're carrying too much equipment that's just there for not really a good reason, you're wasting energy yeah. and you can get yourself killed. So you start to find multi-uses for everything. And that Shema is a perfect example of that. Um, so, you know, we've been live for just shy of 90 minutes here. So as we've talked through, you know, how we got to this place, the types of things that you were doing, atmospherics, customization, um, beer, yeah. what would you say, like, what would you say when it was time to go looking back at the summation of, of a career? Um, what were your takeaways on the out? What were you saying? Like, okay, this gave me the X, Y, Z. What What was the end result for you? It, interesting question because I, I I actually don't remember the the point where I said no. That this this is kind of no, no more. What what so what happened? I had been I had started making a video diary and. Over mm -hmm. time, I had a, f a friend in the UK who had done a lot of work in documentary, and I just started making some some funny videos for friends in in my team, you know, days on the range and stuff. And when I went back to the UK and showed these to my friend, he's like, "You you've got like a natural talent for editing," and that, that was you know, this is a, my very first time ever editing anything. And he was like, right. "The way you cut, you know, because I would put a, you know like an ACDC soundtrack." And he's like, "But." Just the way you frame shots, the way you cut to the beats of the music, you know, it's it's way better than someone who's just gone into Windows Movie Maker kind of thing. Right. He's like, you've got a unique opportunity here where, you know, no one, you know, the military has embedded journalists. No one gets inside private security companies because they're all worried about losing their contracts if something comes out. Right. So I started keeping a video diary and began building on a documentary. And I had kind of finished that when I still had a year left to go in Iraq. And in the background, I was trying to get it on TV in the United Kingdom. 
um, and it was almost sold to um, to Channel Four in the UK. They've got a, a documentary um, kind of program called uh, Dispatches. It was going to be released as part of a Dispatches series, right, um, yeah. but the company I worked for was like, "No, nah, you've got a confidentiality clause in your contract. Everything you've filmed, um, we own it." Uh, like they never got the footage off me, but they're like, you know, because part of my job doing these reconnaissance reports, I was having to take photos as part of the job. And even yeah. though they never issued me with a video camera, they're saying that you're doing out there, you're taking photography. We, so they never got the footage off me, but I was never able to release it. And right. I all of a sudden had these kind of, I'd become incredibly passionate about filmmaking while I was there. And I'm like, you know, I've, wor I've worked all these years on, on this documentary. It's never going to be seen. Um, what do I do? And I was like, I've been a toy collector all these years, mainly of Action Man. No one's ever done a documentary. I'd seen a documentary about the original 60s G.I. Joe. Um, yeah. And it's a good documentary, but it is 70 minutes of talking heads. Right. And I got to the end of it and being a passionate toy collector, I was like, it's a great documentary. It's a great story. And I'm not sliding the people who made it. But as a toy collector, I was like, I wanted to see more toys. Right. You're talking, really about, talking a toy. about the toys. You know, you did see some, but not a lot. So I right. came up with this idea of making a documentary about Action Man, which would be a bit of both. A lot of talking head interviews, but also me narrating over all the different toys that they developed over 18 years and, um, when that started to become a reality, I, I left Iraq with the intention of taking six months off to make the documentary. Six months turned into nine months. And during that period, I had already known Grace for a number of years. We were in the same circle of friends. During that period when I took all that time off, like I travelled to the UK a few times to do the interviews, but I was pretty much based in my condo in Thailand, editing there and just living the relaxing i say relaxing life i was pretty much a, a functioning alcoholic night owl at the same time as editing a documentary but you know thailand was a relaxing place to be and sure me and grace had become very close during that period she had moved in with me and then at the end of the year i'd run out of money i'd almost finished my documentary and i was like look i need to go back to work and i returned to iraq in late november 2011 during this time, this is when the Americans pu had pulled out. There was a the DOD contract I used to work on had basically been dissolved. It no longer existed. And right. now people were working for oil companies. Mm -hmm. And I turned up and straight away, my what I'm used to, $170,000, $180,000 a year, is now $120,000 a year. Massive, massive drop. And I arrive out there. The conditions are worse. I've gone from like having my own room at the base to now sharing a room with eight guys in bunk beds. Not only that, you would go and spend a couple of nights at an oil rig and you were what we call hot bedding. So you're going to a place, jumping into bed, sleeping the night and, you know, not even knowing the guy who slept in these and sweated in these sheets the nights before, you know. Right. Um, right. And it wasn't like back in the army days where you would comfortably do that with your buddies. I didn't even know half the other guys on this contract. Um, right. The food was terrible and... Um, you know, they the, the, the dog, yeah. The bottom had fallen out of the security industry, but also in me, I was like, I really don't have the passion for this anymore, I don't think. And was contemplating just quitting. And, and what ended up happening, just I, I was there for Christmas. I don't remember that Christmas day. It wasn't a good one. It wasn't a bad one. It was just probably just another day. Um right. But I was there for Christmas Day and New Year's Eve. And a couple of days after New Year's Eve, one of my closest friends who was my 2IC for some time in, in Iraq, um, he was over in Thailand and I had asked him to actually take Grace out for the night. I said, you know, she hasn't done much over Christmas and New Year. Take, take her out for the night, you know, go, go out drinking, go out with a circle of friends. And, um, you know, I trust this man with my life and I trust him with my wife and, and, and still do. Um and he took Grace out that night. Later on in the evening, they were with some other mates as well. They were in a nightclub and totally unrelated. A couple of other Thai girls ended up. Um, there was an altercation between these girls and Grace, and she got um, hit in the face with a broken whiskey glass by one of these crazy Thai girls. And it, Ooh. it snapped a tooth, 
um, cut her lip open. She had a puncture wound in the top of her lip as well. Um, I get woken early in the morning in Iraq from a phone call from my friend. He's got Grace at the hospital. He's covering all of her medical bills and everything. And I'm like, dude, how, how is she? Do I need to come back? And he said, well, the question you need to ask yourself is how serious you are about this girl. He said, because I, he knew me very, very well. He'd known me for a very long time. And he'd known me to, for like 10 years, to never have a relationship with a woman. Right. Um, nothing that lasted longer than 48 hours anyway. And he's like, you know, you, you've, you probably don't even realize this, but he could see it in me. He's like, you're really serious about this girl. He's like, if you're serious about her, he's like, you need, you need to, to give that up. Come back. So literally I, I quit my job that day. Um, two days later, I think I was, I was back in Thailand and I said to Grace, my family live in Australia. Um, I, I, I do, I am educated. I've been to college. I have a, a trade qualification. There's a big mining industry. Let's give it a go. You know, at least we can say we tried. What, what I didn't want to do, unlike a lot of my other friends who had Thai, you know, live in Thai girlfriends and Thai wives, they carried on over the years, continuing to go to Iraq, seeing their girlfriends three months a year. And it's not, those long distance relationships don't last. And all these years later, they've all broken down. I think there was a lot of people at the time said me and Grace would never last. And um, it's our ninth wedding anniversary next month. We are still madly in love. Um, I like it because I have the same banter with her that I do with my old army buddies. You know, I can yeah. call her names and she doesn't get offended and she does the same with me. And um, so that's, that's really like a great. I think Grace actually probably saved me because I, I had a lot of mental health issues um, during that nine months that I took off. And then when I first arrived, my first couple of years in, in Australia, I, I really struggled to, to readjust. Oh, um, I, had a, I had a lot of mental health problems, but the, the benefit of having – I had a lot of friends commit suicide as well. Yeah, um, me too. Some in Thailand, some in Iraq. Um, and as heartbreaking as that was to go through, Grace also went through that because she knew – a number of those people. She was in Thailand where one of my good friends hung himself. Um, there was another friend who, who dove off a balcony. Um, her, more than anyone outside of the military anyway, understand. There was also people that, like I, I talked to my parents about about friends that I lost in Iraq, um, you know, friends who, who died in combat. Yeah. Um, my parents try and relate. Grace actually knew some of these people. Right. You know, and that was the, that was the key difference there. She, although she never went to Iraq, she knew what these how amazing these guys were. These incredible personalities that they every, every everyone I've ever met in the military has a, an almost larger than life personality um, that that I have connected in some way or another. You know, not just in the special forces, but you know, in the in the, in the army reserve, in the Australian army. These amazing guys who who had had so much to offer the world and things were were cut too short. Yeah, I think Grace's understanding of that and going through a lot of that grieving process with me is really how we have have bonded and why we have such a, a strong relationship. And um, that wo that woman saved my life, Jim. And um, I probably don't tell her often enough. And I'm starting to get emotional. <laughs> well, now, if any time she starts to complain, you'll be like, "Here's the link." Here's the time code. Go watch it. All right. I almost made Jim cry. Now you go yeah. cry. I don't have to say it again. I said it there. It's there forever. <laughs> Grace, if you're watching, please don't hurt me. I love you. You're the best. Oh, um, she won't. She won't. Uh, Master's on 42. <laughs> MWR is moral welfare recreation. Thank you. Yep. Um, as soon as it's like, oh, yeah, duh. I've, I've contributed so much to the green bean as well. <laughs> right. Um, Timothy Hans says, Tony, I've loved your action force reviews since the beginning. Can't wait for you to do Valiverse action figure reviews. Uh, actually, um, me and me and Bobby are, are trying to, well, Bobby's trying to figure a way that my order gets sent to me straight from China as opposed to going to America and then here so that I'm not delayed in being able to get a review out. You know, it's going to be good for his brand. Um, 
by all means, like, please don't have all these other people reaching out to Bobby. He, he, he can't do that. He can't do that for everyone. Um, he's going to see if he can figure that out for me just so that um, I can get a, a review onto YouTube um, as quick as other people. Because um, when you think when it lands in the States and you start shipping it, everyone in the States is going to get theirs probably two or three weeks before I get mine, maybe even four weeks before I get mine. You know, right, just because Bobby of the really custom situation. Yeah. Get my review out there. So, Gotcha. Cool. So well, we've, we've been going for a long time. I've got some unboxings to do, but what I think I'm going to do is save that for the Patreon only after show because um, we, we, we have been going for like an hour and 40 minutes. So, sure. um, Jim, thank you so much for coming on the channel. I've been really looking forward to sitting down and chatting with you. You know, we've, we've been messaging a little bit on, on Messenger, and I was like, if I, I, I've, so I've done two Desert Rat interviews on G.I. Joe Berg and the Call to Action show. I highly recommend you check out those episodes. Big shout out to those guys. Absolutely. Um, but it's, it, it is difficult getting someone onto your own channel to interview you about something. And, man, hats, you've done an amazing job, Jim. I've really enjoyed this. I, I actually think um, Jim might be a recurring personality on, on the channel. So I'd please take an opportunity now to, um, to plug your own fantastic YouTube channel. I, I appreciate that. Wow. Fantastic. I, that's, I haven't heard that one uh, before. Um, <laughs> first of all thank you for having me um because no matter how impressed you might have been with how i carry myself or even as friendly as we've been in the chats there is still an x factor there because you don't know what's going to happen when when the green light goes on okay so thank you for yeah. trusting me with your story and with your community who are by the way and pardon the fr fucking amazing i yeah. love them so much uh so thank you for that um you know, I do a lot of different things in content creation in terms of I'm not just a toy channel. I'm not just a video game channel. I don't just do uh, social talks. I do all of it. Um, so if you like varied content and you like discussion that can't be contained to a six minute video, um, if you like the way that I carry myself, that is the only reason you should be there because there are far better people in all of the spaces I just mentioned. So if you're coming to my channel, come for me because that's about all you're going to get. Um, <laughs> easiest way to get there would be grindheadgym.com slash YouTube. And that'll work for any platform that I'm on. Instagram, Twitch, Twitter, Facebook, all of it. Uh, I have my own Patreon as well. And I've been slowly building up content for a while. So that when people finally start latching onto it, there's going to be something really cool for them to experience. I like to have that deep level of connection with community. So uh, yeah. if you'd come along, we'd really appreciate it. And uh, I would absolutely be honored to come back here anytime you want. You just give the word and I will be your backup anytime, man. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. Um, we've got a couple of final super chats here. Wolfhound, thank you. He says, uh, well said, Tony. Um, and Wolfie762, thank you for your service, Tony. Thanks, Jim. Excellent chat. Uh, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. So what we'll do, we're going we're gonna to wrap up the show for now, and in about 20 minutes' time, I'm going to get out of this body armor, um, go make myself another drink, have a quick smoke, and then there'll be a Patreon-only live stream. If you're not a patron of the channel, um, head over to Patreon, look up Analog Toys, there are four different tiers, but for $1 a month, you get access to the Patreon-only live streams uh, that we I try and do at least one a month, plus tons of other content. Depending on what tier you're at, I get a lot of video messages and all that kind of stuff. So Patreon after show today is going to be some unboxings, and I am actually might put some photos up on the screen. I had all these photos prepared, and I got so engaged in the conversation, I never put it yeah. up. Yeah, I pulled so, them down too, and I was like, because ah, there was one story told. I, I bet I know which what the photo this is from, yeah, and I, just, I couldn't, I couldn't stop it. Right, and by the yeah. way, chat, a dollar gets you access, but don't be a cheap ass. Pay more than a dollar. He's worth way more than a dollar. <laughs> you you do get more benefits if you pay more than a dollar. So you get the the patron only video messages and stuff like that as well. So, all right, um, thanks everyone, and I'll see the patrons in about twenty twenty five minutes. So. See you later. Cheers, guys.